talk now is uh, from Victor van de Veen, right? And he's coming from Amsterdam, and he will tell us a few things about drummer Flip Feng Sui Goes Mobile. Victor, the floor yes. is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm Victor van der Veen. Uh, I'm from Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. I'm very happy to be here again at the Android Security Symposium. And uh, talk today about drummer Flip Feng Sui Goes Mobile. Um, so that means I'm going to talk about two things, Drummer and Flip Feng Shui. A uh, little bit about our group. So I'm a Vrije Universiteit. We uh, are in the, I'm a PhD candidate and I'm in the um, uh, system and network security group. But um, recently we've uh, branded, our, rebranded ourselves into FUSEC. We have a website, so FUSEC. And um, basically everything in our group resource around this guy. It's uh, Herbert Bus. he's our professor. And then all the other people are very smart people standing around him. Um, we do uh, many cool stuff, or at least we think we do cool stuff. Today I'm talking about hardware vulnerabilities. Um, but uh, we also do uh, research on the other topics. Um, I was actually last week at NDSS and I was able to present work of a colleague of mine, Sanjay, on uh, software testing. So we have a new fuzzer that I presented there. I also know everything about fuzzers now. Um, before Dremmer, I did research on uh, binary armoring. So I'm trying to protect binaries against uh, code reuse attacks or ROP attacks. Um, we also do malware analysis. So we were involved in bringing down the game over Zeus botnet a couple years ago. Um, uh, on the topic of hardware vulnerabilities, we also recently had a paper at NSS on side telling the MMU to break ASLR from JavaScript. Um, so we do a lot of cool stuff, and today I'm going to talk about two things. Um, if there's something after today that you should remember, uh, so you take away a message, is that we can now do row hammer on, row hammer on ARM. Um, we can use Rawhammer to do reliable exploitation, and it also works on a Google Pixel. Um, so by the way, who here is familiar with Rawhammer? Okay, quite some people. For those who are not familiar, I'm going to explain this uh, in a minute. Um, Flip Feng Shui is uh, basically a set of three papers in 2016, all published at top tier uh, scientific venues, and it is actually the art of turning a bit flip with Rawhammer um, into reliable exploitation of the cloud, of the browser, and the mobile. So these are three papers that we published. Um, today I'm going to talk about the cloud, how we use Rawhammer to break, break the cloud, and um, uh, how to use Rawhammer to break, break the mobile. Um, the first paper we did was uh, breaking the browser. So we have an attack against Microsoft Edge. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today because it's too difficult, <laughs> or at least I don't know much uh, about it. Um, but I'm going to discuss the other papers. Um, but this is some promotional, uh, uh, a bit of the talk. Um, um, I uh, first time, a couple of weeks ago, I gave this presentation to Dutch company. And I wanted to highlight that these are uh, Dutch papers done by Dutch researchers and presented at top venues in computer security. And actually, also in 2016, one of the uh, one of the ranking uh, lists uh, put us on first place, better than MIT, because of all our cool publications. Um, so uh, we also had worldwide impact. Besides from publishing at the scientific venues, we had art articles in Ars Technica and Wired about a lot of the things we do. Um, also here in Austria. Is it there? Yeah, there's stand up had an article. And um, this comment was, I think, the most funny one uh, from all the work we did. Um, it was on Slashdot, on Drammer. So on the, if you then look at the comments that people post, uh, blow articles on Slashdot, there was this one guy saying, yeah, these are a bunch of pasty, spaced, sad sack nurse sitting in a basement that wanted to sound cool and tough like they've just done a tour in NAM. I, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> but actually, there are also uh, other people who said that, that uh, we do important stuff. Um, so, so much for the promotion. Um, let's start with the introduction. So, the requirements to do a flip-fang shui attack, there are basically two, two of them. 
One is we need a hardware bit flip, new DRAM, that we can reproduce. For this, we're going to use Rhymer, but uh, if at some point somebody invents another way to do this, you can also use that. And the second thing we need is the ability to uh, target a bit flip. So be able to get something, uh, some useful data stored in a location in DRAM that you can flip bits in. Um, so let's look uh, into Rhymer. What is Rhymer? How does it work? So Rhymer is a DRAM issue. It's in your hardware, a hardware issue in, in uh, your DRAM. And um, if you look at how DRAM works, then you're basically looking at cells, memory cells, or so-called capacitors. And I'm not really a hardware person, so um, I hope I'm not saying uh, wrong things now. But um, memory cells have a natural discharge rate. So you can, um, you can if you want to store a value in such capacitor, um, you're basically storing a high voltage in one of these capacitors. And over time, this voltage is dis uh, decreasing until a certain threshold, where if you then read, uh, want to read the, the voltage again, <coughs> your data uh, disappeared. So this is why we need to refresh your DRAM cells every 64 milliseconds to make sure that your data never uh, is, is still remains there. Um, now, people found that for some reason, if you have a memory cell, and if you're accessing memory cells that are very close to that one, um, very frequently, then the, 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 the neighboring cell is discharging faster than it should be. And you can use this to do Rhymer, to, uh, to trigger the Rhymer vulnerability. So let's say we have a cell that's charged and it represents a one, one bit. Um, now you're accessing neighboring cells very frequently. And then at some point, the victim cell that has this one stored, this high voltage stored, uh, that its charge is leaking below a certain threshold. Um, until at some point when you read it, the victim cell, um, you're no longer reading a one, but you're reading a zero. So you end up with a disturbance error. <coughs> I have an uh, animation of how this works. So this is the simplest form of Rohmer, single-sided Rohmer. This is your memory, the cells laid out in a matrix. And um, if you're going to access something from your DRAM, you're accessing one row at a time. Um, so let's say you access something and then you're going to read from somewhere else, so nothing, and then you read again. And you repeat this a couple of times, and then you see at some point that one of the neighboring cells of this row, its charge is leaking further and further until at some point the one that was stored there uh, turns into a zero. Um, now some terminology, this is the row that we're reading from is called an aggressor row, and then the row that we flip bits in is a victim row. Um, for Rhymer, it's important to, to note that um, not every bit may flip. So in this scenario, we flip this one zero here, but it could very well be that this one here can never be flipped by doing Rhymer. Um, it could also be that your uh, DRAM chip is not vulnerable at all to Rhymer. Um, but in general, once you have a bit flip, uh, you can reproduce it. So that means that once you know that a certain cell in your memory um, is vulnerable to Rhymer, you can store something in there as an attacker, from an attacker's perspective, and then flip that bit to do something useful. Um, so there was single-sided Rhymer. There's also a double-sided Rhymer. And in this scenario, you're reading from two rows again, but now these two rows are sandwiching your, your victim row. And um, it turned out that this will give you more bit flips and easier or faster. Um, but uh, as I will explain in a minute, it's a bit harder to do double-sided Rohmer because you need to do, you have a couple more requirements. Okay, so <coughs> what are the challenges for an attacker? So let's say you wanna uh, do a Rohmer attack. What do you have to do? Um, so there are two things. One is you need to bypass the CPU cache. Um, I have a slide next, but um, these days, most memory accesses are not actually accessing your DRAM memory, but um, a lot of the data is stored in the cache, CPU cache. And since we're going to read from the same memory region over and over again, 
uh, this data will end up in the cache. And we want to avoid that because the bug is in the DRAM. Um, the second challenge is selecting the aggressor rows. So if we want to do this double-sided row hammer, how do we know from which memory uh, to, to read from? Um, so let's look at the first challenge, uh, bypassing the CPU cache. Um, so I told you the DRAM access is so slow and the CPU caches um, uh, data for fast access. Um, but if we want to do Rohammer, we must read many times from DRAM. So one solution that has been used uh, on Intel platforms a lot is simply use an explicit cache flush instruction. So on x86 it's called seal flush. And uh, if you in, uh, execute this instruction, you basically tell the CPU, uh, please remove this data from the cache so that next time when I read it, the read will go to DRAM. Um, a second option uh, is to use a cache eviction set. And there, basically, uh, after you've read one row uh, into, your, into your cache, you're going to read a couple more uh, uh, data from DRAM. Um, and this causes your cache to evict the original, the first row, one of your first aggressor rows. So the next time you access that aggressor row, um, it will go to uh, DRAM. It will be fetched from DRAM again. Um, for the second challenge, selecting the aggressor rows, uh, we need to know a little bit more about addressing, virtual addresses and physical addresses. Um, if you're addressing, accessing uh, data in your DRAM, you're working with physical addresses, physical memory addresses. If, uh, on the other hand, you have a, a, a program running and you have a buffer allocated there, then you're working with virtual addresses. And um, this mapping from uh, virtual addresses to physical addresses is unpredictable. So you don't really know um, how, from, from which addresses in your software uh, should I read to make sure I'm selecting the two aggressor rows to trigger the Roma bug. So how do, we, how do we figure that out? How do we know that we need to read from these two addresses? Um, one solution is just don't and use two single-sided draw hammer. And then you can just pick any address and um, 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 you end up with um, less interference between rows, so you will see less bit flips. But uh, it was shown that this is still, in many cases, good enough uh, to do reliable exploitation. Um, another solution is uh, page map. So on Linux, you have a special file uh, for every process that is running. And basically, this file, if you read from it, you can uh, find this exact mapping. So you can look up uh, this virtual address I have here in my, in my program, what is the physical address that belongs to it. And then you can use that to find out where uh, to read from. Um, another solution is uh, huge pages. And these are, um, these are virtual allocations that are mapped to physically contiguous uh, chunks. And I think on Linux it's two megabytes these days. So if you have a, a huge page allocation, you end up with a virtual address that is um, contiguous, so the virtual addresses are contiguous but also they map to a contiguous region in your physical memory. And if you know this, if you know that uh, um, a certain allocation is contiguous, then you can very easily uh, select the correct aggressor rows. Okay, so um, the mechanics about from for a flip peng shui attack. Um, the three things, every attack that we do uh, that's, that's has to do these three things. First is memory templating. And with memory templating, we mean we're going to search memory, the entire DRAM or most of the DRAM, for bit flips that we can actually exploit. Um, then when we found a location in memory, we want to land some data there, something that is sensitive. So that's the second step of the attack, landing data at a vulnerable location. And then we're going to reproduce the bit flip and hopefully uh, do something interesting. Okay, good. So <coughs> now let's look at Flip Feng Shui, uh, presented at Usenix by my colleagues. Um, in Flip Feng Shui, uh, uh, also titled Hammering a Needle in a Software Stack, um, we have a malicious VM somewhere in the cloud running on a physical machine, 
and then this malicious VM is going to attack other VMs that are hosted on the same uh, on the same physical machine. We will use Rhymer to flip bits, and we're going to use memory deduplication to get a uh, uh, interesting piece of data at a vulnerable location. Um, so, but let's assume you can flip a bit in another VM. I want you to think a little bit about what would you flip if you're a, if you are an, are an attacker, and um, you want to get access to another VM on the same machine. So think about this a little bit. Um, first step of the attack, memory templating. This is relatively easy for the attacker. Um, so you have the victim and the attacker sharing the same hardware. And uh, the attacker, of course, has root, so he can do uh, a lot of interesting things already. Um, you will use, so this was on x86, you will use cache plus, the explicit cache plus instruction to uh, to make sure he can actually do armor, and then he, he will be able to allocate huge pages, so get physically contiguous memory to select the aggressor rows to do double-sided row armor. Um, so the attacker does that, he allocates a lot of memory, and then um, starts reading from the, from the zeros here until at some point he finds that, hey, here is a bit flip. Um, then the second step of the attack, land sensitive data. So now that we have this bit flip, how do we force the victim to store some sensitive data there? And for this, we are going to use memory deduplication. Um, so I'm going to explain you what memory deduplication is. Um, let's say you have a uh, victim running a program with some memory allocated, uh, store, store here, and then the attacker is running a different program also with some memory allocations here and here. Um, when deduplication is enabled on your system, then the operating system, every now and then, um, will search the entire memory space for pages, memory, that is duplicate. Um, so in this simple example, it will see that um, the victim here is storing this 10100 um, in a memory location, and then the attacker um, somewhere else in memory also has that exact same data stored. Um, now, in cloud providers, they really uh, they really like to to save the resources, right? So you want to uh, if you can if you can uh, save memory, then you can run more VMs on the same physical machine. So what did they do? Um, the operating system, if this is enabled, it will free one of the duplicated pages, and then it will simply up update the mapping from, in this case, the victim, so that it points to this physical location. Um, and as long as this location is uh, read-only, um, this simply works. And then as soon as one of the um, one of the VMs starts writing to it, a copy will be made again. Um, but this is a very useful technique, and it really saves uh, memory. Um, but it also, if you can do Rhymer, it will also allow you to do cool attacks. So, um, Let's say we so, so we now have a way to um, to control data in the victim VM. Now, the question is, what are we going to store in this location? What is interesting enough um, um, for an attacker to to flip one bit in? Um, what's the tool end? We're going to land cryptographic keys. So we have thought about other things as well, for example, pointers or return addresses. Um, but we're going to look at cryptographic keys, and we're also going to look at domain names. And this is very interesting uh, because of this. So we're going to, uh, to look at a public RSA key from the victim stored in the authorized keys file. And we're going to place that here at the location where we can flip a bit. Um, now, what happens if you flip a bit in a public key of an RSA, key, uh, public private key pair? Um, then you change the public key. And uh, there are crypto people here who know more about this, but um, basically for RSA, it works. Or RSA works because um, you're working with two very big prime numbers, P and Q, 
and you multiply these, and then one of the properties of this is that it's very hard, given this one big multiplied number, to go back to P and Q. Um, however, if you have this one big multiplied number and you flip a bit there, then all of a sudden it turns out that in many cases it is very easy to go back to P and Q and a couple more numbers. So <coughs> the attacker, after he flips a bit in the cryptographic key, in the public key, he can compute the new private key that belongs to this public key, and then he can use this uh, new private key to log in via SSH to the machine. Um, now, of course, in this scenario, if you're the attacker, you need to know the SSH key of the victim. Um, there are very useful interfaces on GitHub that you can just query for public keys, so you can use that. But of course, it's still a known, uh, it's still a, a knowledge attack, so you need to have some knowledge. Um, so we have a, a, another attack um, where we also not only flip bits in cryptographic keys, but also in domain names. So let's look at what happens here. Uh, what happens if the victim does a opt-get upgrade on the Ubuntu machine? What happens is that it will query this website, security.ubuntu.com, for example, and ask for, hey, uh, server, do you have updates that I should install? Um, but if this domain is stored in a location in memory where we flip a bit, then we can change ubuntu.com into ubuntu.com. And if the attacker uh, bought this domain, which we did, um, he can now host malicious uh, uh, packages. Um, for in this scenario, we're gonna host uh, an updated core utils package. Um, fortunately, packages are signed, so it's not as easy as this. Um, um, but we simply just also need to flip a bit in the GPG keychain um, to make the, uh, the package itself signed. Um, then the attacker can compute this new GPG key and then sign the back toward LS. And from there on, you just have to wait as an attacker for the victim to run an upgrade. Um, so we disclosed this in uh, June, so last summer with the Dutch Cyber Security Center. They did a really good uh, job on contacting all the vendors. So many cloud uh, parties actually disabled memory deduplication because of this. Um, there was also a GPG patch so that self-signed keys are no longer valid. And um, in the process, we also bought all these domains that are one bit flip away from Ubuntu and uh, Debian. Um, I'm not sure what the current status is, but I think we're still looking for the appropriate party um, maybe uh, Google wants to buy these uh, domains um, <laughs> because it's, uh, it's getting a bit expensive to have all these uh, domains that are one bit flip away. Um, but if you, if you think you are the correct party or if you know somebody who should have these domains, contact me. Um, so then Drammer, the second, uh, second um, topic for this afternoon. Um, this was presented at uh, CCS, so this is my work. I did it when I was in Santa Barbara. I worked there with uh, Yannick, Martina, and uh, Giovanni. Uh, but also people here from uh, Austria were involved, so the grass guys and also VU. Um, and for Tremor, uh, this happened when I was, I was watching my colleagues working on the flip and Shui attack, and I thought, hey, this is cool, we should try this on Android. So the question was, can we do raw hammer attacks on Android? And if you're looking at Android, you're very quickly also looking at ARM instead of x86. Um, we looked into this, did some preliminary uh, study, and then we found that although Android does support memory deduplication, it is uh, mostly disabled. Um, so for Tremor, we're going to exploit the behavior of the underlying memory allocator, and I'm going to explain you a little bit about this. Um, but first, memory templating, so the first phase of the uh, of a flip function we attack. What are the chances again uh, for x86? Uh, we need to bypass a CPU cache, so we can use cache fiction or the explicit cache plus instruction. And if we want to do uh, double-sided draw hammer, um, we can use the page map or use pages. Um, I found relatively soon that if you want to flip bits on ARM, um, you actually need to do double-sided raw hammer because with single-sided raw hammer, it's the chances of flipping bits is uh, uh, just too low. Um, so we have some some options here, right, on x86. Um, 
would be great if we could use any of these on ARM. Uh, so we looked into it. Uh, does it work? Well, of course not. Um, and because the uh, Cache fiction, for example, was too slow. So I implemented this on ARM and didn't work out uh, well enough. Um, the cache was instruction on 32-bit ARM, at least, it's privileged, so you cannot uh, wash memory, uh, flush, memory, flush memory from the cache from user space. Um, the page map is privileged because Google is not stupid. Uh, they fixed this a long time ago. And then huge pages, um, I think they're working on it, but um, back then it was still not available, so it might come soon. Um, so we had to come up with something else. And um, basically the solution was DMA, direct memory access. Uh, because sometimes the CPU cache is something you don't really want. Um, because what happens, for example, if you have another, besides the CPU, if you have, if you have another device here, let's say a GPU or audio device or anything, that is operating on the same DRAM, the same data as CPU, then um, if, if these two devices are operating at the data at the same time, then you don't want this data stored in the CPU cache because the CPU could be working on older data than the GPU is seeing. Um, so this is why uh, every operating system should have some support for DMA, direct memory access. And with DMA, you basically get uncached memory for free. So you don't even have to do any kind of explicit cache flush. Um, for the second challenge, uh, selecting the aggressor rows, um, we found that uh, Google's uh, or Android's uh, DMA, the implementation, already gives us a lot of uh, a lot of useful uh, uh, pinpoints here. So, um, dedicated hardware devices might be very stupid, and um, if you have such simple device, then it cannot always translate virtual to physical addresses correctly. So um, if you want to have DMA memory sharing with, uh, with, with one of these stupid devices, then um, there must be a way to have memory that is contiguous as well. Um, so on Android, uh, it would used to be the case that you could get DMA memory that is also physically contiguous. Um, and then it behaves very much like huge pages. So you get some allocations uh, from in your software, and this is all pointing to memory that is all contiguous in physical memory. Um, so we could use this to solve, address the second challenge. Um, but then the second step of the attack, landing sensitive data. What are we going to do here? So let's, let's look at the threat model. Um, we're going to assume a recent Android operating system, and um, um, without memory deduplication enabled, because it's too costly to have uh, this on, on, on a mobile device. And then we have this unprivileged app who wants to get root access. Um, to get this, to get root access, ultimately your goal is to get read, write access to anywhere in memory. Because if you have that as an unprivileged application, then you can search uh, kernel memory for imported data structures, and uh, one of them being your own credential structure, and then you can override your UID with zero to get uh, root access. Um, so what are we going to do? Uh, we're going to land a page table at a vulnerable location that is vulnerable to Rhymer, and then we're going to flip a bit in a page table entry. So um, the principles of grammar attack. I'm not going to give you the full de details, uh, but just an intuition. Um, page tables. Page tables are used to map virtual addresses to physical addresses. So back to the example, uh, similar example from before, we have a, um, a simple user space program here with a simple buffer allocation. And then here in physical memory, uh, for some reason, this word ended up uh, above uh, the first word, and uh, we end up with this mapping. Um, now, this mapping from virtual addresses to physical addresses is stored in a page table. And a page table is really nothing else than just two columns 
visible errors, uh, B6A57000, is pointing to visible errors 140000. Um, the question, however, is these page tables, um, where are they stored? So, uh, of course, they are stored in memory. Let's say they are stored here, somewhere in between the buffer. Um, now, um, we can read from hello and world over and over again and flip bits in this page table, maybe, if raw armor turns out to be working. Um, but what happens if we do so? So what happens if we flip a bit in this page table? So for example, what happens if you flip a bit? Oh no, we get, what happens if you flip a bit? We can modify mappings. And for example, let's flip this one here into a zero. Um, what happens is that the physical errors is no longer one four zero zero zero, but one zero 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 zero. So the the mapping that was pointing to hello is no longer pointing to hello, but is now pointing to a page table, to our own page table. And if we have access now to this page table, um, we can change it. And with this, we can get read-write access to anywhere in memory, because we can modify existing entries and then make this uh, this virtual address point to somewhere else in memory where we never had access to before. Or we can add new entries to it and uh, use this to get uh, access to anywhere in memory. Um, so if you have this, if you have access to the page table, then from there on getting root access is relatively easy. Um, the question, however, is how do you get this page table stored at this exact location? Uh, because why wouldn't it be stored here or here? Um, how do you get it there? And for this, we in the paper we describe Fish Feng Shui, which is uh, a physical memory massaging uh, primitive. And I will show you the intuition. Um, let's say that these are memory cells and you are running your Android phone you have some allocations going on, so these are existing allocations. Um, if you allocate memory on Android, then the, the, the Linux underlying body allocator will try to satisfy every allocation with the uh, smallest amount of memory that is available. Um, but let's, let's look first at the first step in your tech, allocating large chunks to do actually templating. So first look at uh, memory that is vulnerable to raw memory. Um, so we're going to read from rows, and then at some point we find a bit flip. Um, now, um, in the following step of grammar, we're going to allocate smaller chunks until all these small chunks uh, are exhausted. Um, next, we release part of the memory that is vulnerable, and this is also is the same size as these small chunks, um, so that in the following step, when we actually trigger the allocation of a page table, we force the system to store it here, because this really is the only place in memory that is available uh, for the system to store its page table. Um, so that's in broad strokes the intuition. Um, how does it look like when we reproduce a bit flip? People have been asking me, so I figured it would be nice to show you an example. Um, uh, I was lazy enough to not uh, write for loops and checks for this, so I've been working a lot on just trying to find where the bit flip is, and it's uh, there. <laughs> um, and then we did some, some analysis on this, uh, so we looked at um, uh, 27 devices for the original paper. And we found bit flips on 18 of them, so not every device was vulnerable. And interesting enough, if you look at one device, so the Nexus 5, for example, uh, it could be that you have a Nexus 5 with zero bit flips, not uh, vulnerable at all. But then the second Nexus 5 you take has close to a million bit flips. Um, it could be that the first bit flip that you can actually exploit, because not every bit flip is exploitable. It could be that the first bit flip that you find that you can exploit uh, could be after one second, or sometimes it is after 15 minutes. Um, so there's a lot of variation going on there. 
um, we did some computations and we found that uh, once you have this first bit slip that you can exploit, you can do the entire end-to-end -end exploit in 22 seconds. Um, and then we wrote a, a grammar test application, which we uh, tried to publish in Google Play, but it didn't really work out. Uh, anyway, people still uh, found it, and uh, people ran it. Uh, we found bit slips on the Google Pixel, so even even very up-to-date hardware is still vulnerable to this polymer. Um, people found bit slips on the OnePlus 3, and also people were crazy enough to run this on the Galaxy Note 7 and reported bit slips there. Um, so we contacted Google uh, about the, the, this issue after we wrote the paper, and we did this on July 25. So why is this important, this date? It's important because it was 91 days before CCS. And Google's own uh, Project Zero team, so the, the guys at Google working for uh, vulnerabilities, they give Google 90 days to fix the issues. So we were 90 da 91 days before, uh, before public, uh, public disclosure, so uh, pretty well in time. Um, and then at some point we had a video call with them, and pretty soon in the video call they said, yeah, can you maybe publish at another, at another venue later this year? So uh, we said no, and then uh, what if we support you financially, so give you some money to, to delay publication? Uh, again we said uh, no. <laughs> And then they ask, okay, well, so what, uh, what if you, uh, can you maybe change some part of the paper to make it a bit more harder for other people to reproduce the text, or obfuscate the paper? And again, we said no. <laughs> uh, but ultimately we were rewarded $4,000. Um, and in November, there was a partial, uh, partial fix and they were continued, they were going to work on the better solution. I think they already released this. Um, However, I do think that uh, even on the Google Pixel, you could still pull a similar attack. Um, so in conclusion, now what? Um, with Dremor, we've shown that we have um, wide, we do widespread Roamer exploitation, is actually a thing. Uh, you can do Roamer to, to break your cloud, the browser, and the mobile, and um, bit slips have been reported on all kinds of uh, DRAM modules, even the ones that you uh, that you can get now. Um, Dremor gives you reliable exploitation without relying on custom memory management management features like deduplication. So it's really hard to stop these kind of attacks. Um, I want to emphasize here that we also work on uh, defenses. So. Uh, last year we broke everything. Uh, hopefully this year we can uh, solve everything again. Um, the problem is that with defenses, are, they are not very interesting for the media to pick up. So um, um, it's important to say that we also work on stopping these kind of attacks. Um, I think for Rarmer, it, it's showing that um, software was really never designed to deal with bit slips. And um, the proposed defenses so far, they're still very early stages and easily bypassed. And also on hard, at the hardware level, there are some mitigations proposed, but they're still optional. And basically, I think you cannot really fix Rhymer. So if you have a software bug, you can update uh, the software, have a patch out, and then your software is, is fine again. But with Rhymer, um, you cannot open your phone and then uh, disassemble the DRAM chip, fix the DRAM chip, put it back in, and then you have a working phone again. Uh, so it's a very hard problem to fix. And I think more research is necessary uh, on this topic. So with that, I conclude. Uh, we have a web page at FUSEC with a lot of more information. Um, there's an open source version of the code that gives you, um, uh, that allows you to search uh, for bit flips. Uh, also here at the uh, web page, you can find the actual application that you can run on your phone and uh, try to search for flips, see whether you are vulnerable. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. I guess we have some questions. One on the back. Hello. 
my question um, is about scalability. So we have been working uh, a lot on Roamer as well, and we had this question about the scalability. I would like to get your opinion about it. Um, so basically, when you are able to have a successful uh, Roamer effect on one mobile, let's say on one Google Pixel, what do you think about the scalability of how much you can apply the same to same device? So, uh, not sure if I understand correctly. You, you want to know how many devices are actually vulnerable? No. Let's imagine that you have a successful scenario on one device, one Google Pixel, okay? Uh -huh. And you have another Google Pixel. How much we can apply the same attack, exactly the same script from what that was working on mine, on yours? Ah, so whether the bit tips you see on one device, uh, are they the same bit tips you see on another device? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, we looked into this. I have data that should be, I should be able to compare, but I didn't do that yet. So we don't really know. Um, I think it's going to be quite random. And maybe at the, um, uh, because already you have devices, two, if you have two the same devices, it could be that one has no bit tips at all. Um, I think if you're going to look at uh, memory batches, so actual physical DRAM chips, then that might be more, uh, then you might be able to see something there. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, hi. Two questions for Rebel again. Uh, first one is, how easy it is to find an area in which you can really do a bit flip? Um, I mean, it seems that you have to know a little bit of structural information that's stored there, because otherwise you would just say, so just uh, finding the first uh, exploitable bit flip, you mean, or just a bit flip at all? Yeah, finding one. I mean, uh, you're injecting information that are related to the data structure already stored in your memory. So if you don't know the data structure, how can you really figure out where to inject? So for finding the bit flips, you don't need to have, uh, you, need, you don't need to do anything for this. You just uh, ask uh, Android to give you some uh, DMA memory, and then you just write uh, values to it, and then you basically read from it, and then you observe whether somewhere else in that same chunk you see bit flip. Um, and then for the, um, as soon as you want to land this page table structure, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that basically with, with the FISMAX UE approach, it's very easy to get it at the exact correct location in memory. Okay, the second question is, you said that when the first one was found, then the other ones were coming after 20 seconds, more or less. Ah, no, no, no. The, um, um, one, one, so not every bit flip is exploitable, because in the page table, uh, you need to have the bit flip at the exact location to make sure you actually can let it point back to something you control. Um, but once you have that, once you have a bit flip that you can exploit, which you can all compute beforehand, um, then from there on, so you, you get access to a page table, and then you need to, s to scan the kernel memory for important data structures. And there's some ASLR there, so you need to do some brute force uh, searches, um, and that takes at most 22 seconds. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, one question, you, you mentioned that uh, you explored the hardware protection and uh, still, uh, even with hardware protection, uh, the raw hammer attack is possible. So I'm interested in this ECC memory, if uh, with ECC memory, this attack is still possible. Um, that's a very good question. In general, no. Uh, but also I would like to say that we, also with the other at hardware defenses, if they are deployed, then I should be able to uh, stop drawer attacks. So we even, the problem is that, um, so ECC, you won't see it soon, I guess, in phones, but uh, the other medication is there, it's still optional. And um, even if the DRAM might be shipped with this medication, then um, the, the chip manufacturer may decide not to use it at all. So that is why even if you have these defenses in place, they're working on it, they're still not really uh, deployed. So without, with ECC enabled, it's not possible? Um, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's, uh, it's gonna be a bit harder. Um, um, I'm not sure if I uh, should if I should make a claim. It's not possible. No. 
if you have, for example, more than one BitClip in the same uh, region that is used for the ECC checks, uh, then you may be able to bypass the, the ECC check. Thank you. So we have one last question. Okay, then thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.